Good morning. Happy Aloha Friday. I'm Yanji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji. This is Spotlight Hawaii. And Ryan, we want to get right to our guest because this morning we have so much to talk about. That's why we're bringing in Honolulu Mayor Rick Blangiardi, joining us from Honolulu Hale. Good morning, Mayor. Thanks so much for joining us. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Yanji. Thank you. Uh, what an intimidating open. We have so much to talk about. <laughs> we do have so much to talk about it. So let's get right to it. Uh, okay. I want to first start off, of course, with COVID-19, where we're at. We're seeing uh, uh, some higher numbers than, of course, what we've been seeing uh, over the past month. We, we are seeing that flu fluctuation going up and down. Uh, what are your overall thoughts on where we're at right now as a city in, in dealing with COVID-19 overall? Well, what I like first and foremost is as of today, we'll break the million two number in vaccines probably by tomorrow. Actually, projection I was given was a million two twenty. Our goal is to try to get to two million vaccines on a two on a two shot model. Now, we're really encouraged by the fact that J and J is back, and the the city or the state had actually thirty thousand in the freezer of J and J. So, uh, you know, we uh, we like our distribution platforms. We like the willingness of our people. I saw a piece of research two weeks ago done by the state that 91% of our residents are willing to be vaccinated. We've been concerned a little bit about the vaccine hesitancy or the shift, if you will, where we had before in the beginning, you know, a real sense of urgency. When we opened up with 75 plus in our first responders, and then it was 65 plus. There were people eager, obviously, because of the vulnerability to protect themselves. But now that we've got it into a more of an open situation, there's been a little bit of a casual approach in some cases our efforts are going forward are going to be to kind of pump up the volume to get us to that two million sooner rather than later and given our capacity and given the supply we expect to have from all three sources we could be there before june and i think that's going to be very important uh to get to a million people vaccinated in what many would say is sort of the respectable if you will uh herd immunity now i'm not an expert and i'm an epidemiologist but it would seem to me if we get a million out of our roughly a million four people vaccinated uh, that's a good place to be. We want to get there sooner rather than later. And, and in an effort to get there sooner than later, there are some who are calling for vaccine mandates in certain situations. We saw the University of Cal California system and Cal State, uh, you know, they're mandating it for all their students and all of their faculty. That's something that we know UH is considering. Some of the health systems are also considering it. What, do, what are your thoughts on vaccine mandates? Would the, we ever see a scenario where to be a city employee, you would have to be vaccinated? Well, we haven't thought about that, to be candid with you. I mean, I've listened to the arguments on mandating vaccines um, and what public institutions or government institutions are able to do and what private institutions can do. And many private organizations have now mandated that. Uh, look, I'm all for in the best interest of public health. This has been the most bizarre experience any of us have been through uh, in our lifetimes. And so uh, while we haven't entertained that right now, my, my approach has been rather than mandate and our discussion on our marketing messages going forward is to be as encouraging and as positive as possible. Look, our goodwill, the community, our people, who we are, and their practices got us into tier three much sooner than people thought we would. And that was a result of a lot of good behavior. The fact that 91% of our people are willing to be vaccinated is also a good statistic. And until proof otherwise, I don't necessarily want to get into the mandates as much as I want to do to make sure we can get to that aggregate gross number I just mentioned of roughly having 1 million people vaccinated. I'm looking at it at that way at this point in time. We, of course, like to bring in some of the viewer questions that come in. Uh, one coming in from Chad asking, when can spectators be able to watch games outdoors, like sitting six feet apart at games? Do you anticipate any changes to any of the current regulations that are put forth right now in the tier system, like uh, watching outdoor sporting events? Well, you know, I'd like to be able to say yes to that right away. I honestly don't know. Uh, I had a meeting in here this morning about doing something with the symphony that our corporate council approved with 300 seats outside at, that, at the Waikiki Shell uh, is sort of a, a beginning pattern of that. I mean, I, you know, um, that's not something that I get to control on, 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 on that basis. Uh, that's really at the state level. Uh, we have been hopeful, as you know, we've been in this sort of four week reprieve when we went forward to ask for a third modification to tier three from 50 to 100. What the governor decided to do in the Department of Health was to allow four weeks uh, more as an extension that's up next Friday. You mentioned Yanji in the opening about the case counts being, you know, fluctuating, and that's exactly what's been happening. 
Uh, and so there's always some concern about case counts. I met last night with our medical team, and I, again, I don't want to dismiss that. Um, but at the end of the day, what we have maintained, so for some time, even before we got into tier three, is you know no demand on our hospitals, very very low uh, penetration or, or need for intense uh, or acute care, hospital care, ICU. Uh, and you know while we have had some deaths from time to time over the course of time, and I would never be cavalier about that. Uh, but there's also, if you listen to the experts, there's been a lot of issues involved about the comorbidity rates, people who have actually died, other situations that they were suffering from, et cetera. None of that stuff really ever gets released. Overall, we've had the best numbers in the country since the pandemic started. We've had good practices here, and I want to respect our public as we go forward. And I also want to encourage, going back to the question, if we can start to get into some venues and have people properly spaced and, and expand that, I would be in favor of doing that. I think, again, I believe in the efficacy of the drug. And we, as we start to do, or we get to where we are now with a million two vaccine, keep in mind, when the tier systems were constructed, it was very conspicuous. It didn't include the vaccines. And I just had that verified just last night. I was on a, a discussion uh, with the guys who drafted the tier system, and they admit that. It wasn't supposed to be available to us, and if if it was available, till either late summer or early fall of 2021. All of those models were predicated on just public behavior, and and so you know wearing masks and socially distancing. We now have had the benefit, uh, uh, the great benefit of, of what the vaccines have brought in, in the way of uh, mitigating acute hospital care in in, in deaths in deaths. So that's important to look at as we try to evolve. Now you did mention that uh, that that four week period is up in 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 about a week. Arnold wants to know what are your thoughts on the current tier system? Any possibility of changing the metrics for tier four? What what will it take to get to tier four? And and are you comfortable staying in tier three? What what do you project happening after next week? Well, what I would like to do as mayor, let me be clear about this: is I would like to uh, expand tier three to be fifty to one hundred, maybe even one hundred and twenty, uh, in case counts, because again the lack of pressure against our hospitals and acute hospital care. Uh, and, and we would stay in that tier three model. I think if we can do that and, 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 and open up and get some of these other activities going, um, and and again, the demographics have shifted and who's getting, uh, getting the disease and the degree of severity. And I'm not one or an expert to talk about the potential linear effects. So I don't wanna minimize the disease in any way. It's very prevalent and it's here and it's real. Uh, but our control of it has been has been good. So what I could envision is if we could stay in a modified yet again, one more modification to tier three with some some additional openings. We've put in up we're putting in a proposal to get road races going again and swim meets going and some of the other things and, and potentially um, you know looking at attendance in public venues with proper distancing. If we could do that and we get to to a million people, two million vaccines, I would actually try to move to abolishing the tier structure because I think it's creating some confusion uh, in the minds of some people on the ability to go forward because again, it was drafted without consideration of vaccines. To switch gears uh, right now away from COVID-19, another uh, headline that continues to come up uh, recently has just been uh, some of the crime that's happening here on the island of Oahu. We're seeing uh, an increase, of course, in uh, things that are happening with the Honolulu Police Department. Uh, we've seen a, a number of police-related deaths uh, also happening. Wanted to just get your overall general thought of what's happening right now here on the island with uh, a lot of this crime that's happening. Look, we went into it when I announced I was going to run for mayor. Crime was an issue then. In the fall of 2019, we were having similar events. There seemed to be a rash of burglaries and robberies and shootings even. And we've seen that same thing again. I look, I have a lot of confidence in our police force. You know, police pol police protection has become a, a, a very big topic uh, all over the country in all kinds of cities. And we certainly have been in, this, in the spotlight, if you don't mind my saying it, over the last several weeks with the shootings we've had here. I don't like any of this. Um, it's not a lack of confidence in our police department. It's you know, uh, it's 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 something whether we have to pay full attention to. I saw this morning, I haven't had a chance to read it, that Steve Arm has come out talking about as a prosecutor, uh, a different mode, if you will, and how we're going to handle uh, some of these crimes. We, we've just got to get tougher. I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm on the side of, uh, 
you know, protecting our people. And, and that means law enforcement needs to be as strong as we can possibly make it. You know, on the topic of law enforcement, of course, you have Chief Ballard uh, taking taking leave now, um, on sick leave right now, and obviously stepping down. What kind of a person, I know that's not your direct hire, but what kind of a person, what, are, what do you envision the chief being? What kind of qualities are you hoping for in the next chief? Well, as I just said about the whole subject of police protection and and, uh, and, and what that represents to communities. And in your very last question, you're, you're asking and the concerns. So first and foremost, this is a very important leadership job for the city, you know? And so you've got to look at somebody who brings those leadership attributes. And so I would start first and foremost with their knowledge of policing of a department and what their belief systems are. How do they believe in it? What do they see? How do they see the future of police operations here uh, in Hawaii. And if for the fact we're able to promote, and I believe we will, somebody from internally, you know, who are they? What's been their track record of success in the department themselves? Are they the kind of person that people will want to follow? Um, and so those kinds of attributes. The other thing I'm really going to look for, if I had a say, and hopefully I'll have at least an interview, what I said in the beginning, this is the police commission's hire, you know, uh, but I, I asked if I could help recruit. You know, but I would look for strong communication skills. You know, I'm talking to people who are journalists. We all know the issues here from the standpoint of transparency or lack thereof. And, you know, and I think a modern day police chief in the 21st century in a dynamic city like Honolulu that has the issues that it has. And I think overall we're better off than a lot of other places, but still yet we have serious issues here. I want a police chief that can stand up and talk to the public and know what to do and how to say it and address it in a proper way. Those would just be some of the attributes, but I would look for that. I think fundamentally, you want somebody who has that intangible that people want to follow. It's just that kind of a person, and, and they've earned that respect by the very essence of who they are. And we should know it because I think we're anticipating an internal promotion. There should be really good knowledge of this person and what it is they represent in that regard. Another hot topic, if you will, here on the island of Oahu is homelessness. Earlier this month, we spoke to your director, Anton Krucki, who outlined what his vision would be in revamping the way in which homelessness is dealt with on the city level. Wanted to get your thoughts on where that department is right now with that program and this new approach to tackling homelessness. Well, I'm very encouraged by Anton's uh, contributions already in his mindset. You know, we put Anton, we asked Anton to accept that position because we wanted to apply a different analytical mindset to the challenge. We knew that compassion disruption wasn't working. We knew that we had to do some things different. We were also very familiar, at least I was certainly in my prior work uh, on the subject of homelessness for more than a decade uh, on, on other models, other places that have worked. We wanted to take the police the police department off the tip of the spear, if you will, on how we interact with people. We've done a really good assessment now working with homeless service providers. I was on a call earlier this morning with the Hawaii Executive Collaborative and also talking with Mike Connie from Hawaii Community Foundation. We have lots of resources here, uh, as he probably told you about where we are right on that threshold. So as we begin to get some federal monies now, which is what we need to stand up and help us with some of this, we're about ready to start making a difference. I believe we will. I think we're going to make a significant difference. I mentioned last time, I believe, when I talked to you folks, if I were, and I'm sure Anton maybe covered the numbers. Right now, it's estimated we've got about 6,000 people that are homeless on Oahu. Um, we've got a really fragile community out there with our Alice folks, and we're trying to get monies distributed to them through our rent utility relief program and anything else that we can possibly do. But of those 6,000, about 3,000 are currently sheltered. Of the remaining 3,000, it's pretty much divided into thirds. It's, uh, and I'm giving you rough numbers, but you've got a third of those people, families, who really are trying to get into shelter, need some help, support, willing, able to do. We need to facilitate that migration. You've got another third, though, people, another thousand or so people who are severely mentally ill um, or drug problems or other kinds of things in which they need really specialized services. We need to be able to attack that. And as I understand that, unfortunately, and maybe it speaks to a little bit of the crime that you were mentioning, Ryan, earlier, you know, you've got about a third of the people out there that have just gone renegade. You know, it's just, I'm not going to pay for anything. I want to live in the street. And I'm going to be who I am and you can't make me do so otherwise. And we want to deal with that, too. So, you know, I think that at the, at the end of the day, if I looked at it, 3,000, 4,000 people, to me, for a city of our caliber, for the resources that we have, if we employ them properly with a good strategy, that's a very scalable problem. And we want to expect to make a very big difference with it as well. And, and we're excited about making a difference in that. 
want to go back to something that you said earlier about potentially wanting to abolish the tier system. What would that then look like? And, and how soon would you want to do that? If you did, in fact, get rid of that, would you replace it with other restrictions? Or are you talking about just sort of going back to life as it was pre-pandemic? No, neither one. In fact, you know, you, right away you want to talk about other restrictions. No, what we would do is what we would remove is the tier model because it really doesn't have any validity against a vaccinated population, but we would maintain the best practices as far as living with the disease from the standpoint that I know the governor took a position this week contrary to the CDC on mask wearing outside, uh, but we would want to try to engage in all that same thing as long as it was as we needed to. So we wouldn't suddenly go back to normal uh, per se. I want to be very respectful of the governor's proclamation on how he wants that behavior in the marketplace, uh, even though a lot of experts have told me we don't need to wear a mask outside and, and avoid, uh, you know, and avoid large gatherings. But I think we would, we would absent the tier and the myopia, if you will, of looking at case counts, keeping the metrics on deaths and acute hospital care and wanting that to remain down. We would just go forward at living with this disease by, I don't know how long, I don't think anybody can predict we're going to be asked to wear masks indoors. We do understand the transmission of the disease and how that comes about. We want to avoid the gatherings. But I'm going to say it again. If within two months we can get to a million people vaccinated, and we won't stop vaccinating then. And I've been listening to and paying attention to the clinical trials on the mainland. We, we may start to actually vaccinate the kids as well. Um, you know, we've got to believe in the efficacy of the drug and where we are with that in overcoming this disease. So it would be, it would be about that. It would be on a positive note. Of, of keeping safe practices as long as the disease is a threat, but at the same time trying to get back to our life and continue to vaccinate our people to protect us. Yet another, there seems to be so much topics that we want to talk with you, but another you're topic. Right, you're right. Look, I, I love, I love, and I love it. Look, I'm, look, we're living with this 24 7. I want you to know we're trying to keep the public safe at the same time move forward. And candidly, I, I really want to be able to say this on the show it's a broader definition of public health. And, you know, we were shut in for a long time, but now you've got to look at where we are and how we evolve. And I realize for some people that's very unsettling, you know, and, and, you know, but it's about moving forward. And so we're not going to force anybody to do anything that they don't want to do, but we are moving into a different time and place. And that's, that's cause to celebrate and get excited about it as we start to see people trying to reopen businesses and get back to work. Great. You know, another topic, of course, is rail. Wanted to get your comments on the rail project, where we're at right now. Uh, a big headline that came out yesterday was former U.S. Uh, House of Representative Colleen Hanabusa being awarded a contract as a consultant. Wanted to get your thoughts on that. But overall, where we're at right now with the rail project and any discussion you recently had with anyone at heart on uh, the funding mechanism moving forward. Sure. Well, let me first of all say that I was really pleased to see Colleen get that consultancy because I think she's one of the smartest people I've met anywhere at any time. I had to compete against her, but I've known her from past life. I mean, I was, uh, you know, candidly, and I was really disappointed. Let me just say this, since I'm talking to the star, I was disappointed in that headline. To run that out on a multiple of what she's going to earn, you know, on an annual basis was a distortion, if you will. And yet again, one more perspective that people would think that rail is somehow uh, out of control. I think that she's going to bring a real depth and breadth of knowledge that we think we needed infused. Look, for the last four months, you know, let me just set the table here. We walked into this. I was new to the mayor's office, but also so was the CEO new to being the head of Hart. We had an open rift that was very dysfunctional between the prior mayor and Hart. When I talked to Jane Williams, who was then the acting director for the FTA before I took office, she said, the one thing I'll give you advice to, Rick, is get your act together with Hart. The city and Hart need to be speaking one voice. Since that time, we have in moving in, Lori in her position, Lori Kayakin as the CEO, uh, along with the weekly meetings we have, she brings in Rick Keen, who's our deputy and chief operating officer. And I also have Roger Morton, who's our head of DTS in the meetings, along with John Nauchi and Mike Mike Formby. We we meet, we discuss regularly, and we have some really up, updated plans on where we are and recognizing the funding gap. And for that matter, I've actually gone out to the Rail Operating Center. I've ridden on the train. We've talked about it. I think we've been really briefed on the issues, um, both existing on what's been constructed and the challenges ahead. Just this past week, for the very first time, I spoke to the FTA. And I told the FTA that we will be in Washington July, August at the later, latest, perhaps maybe July, uh, with a plan, which is what they want to see about where we're going going forward. Do I have a solution for the $3.5 funding gap? No. 
nobody does right now as it is we're dealing with maybe you're going to bring up the whole tat thing and how that could possibly impact us on revenue um so we're i don't want to get ahead of myself and how we're talking to the fda i can tell you this we are working in a very close cooperative manner where we're, we're not pulling any punches about the reality of rail on any level on the responsible parties uh, i'm not interested since you haven't asked me i'll just volunteer i'm not interested in interim operations um, but at this point right now we're in the process of finalizing those plans on where we think we are and how long it'll take us to get to where we're going so um i could say a lot more but i'm going to leave it at that <laughs> we always invite you to say more just just briefly on that do you do, that. Do, you, <laughs> do you think the rail is going to make it to ala moana given all of the challenges right now i don't have that information right now that's part of what we're putting together you know, look we campaigned on on, on the merits of saying the following, that we owed it to the public, given the incredible investment that's been made to build the best rail possible. Al Moana was a predetermined destination some 15 years ago, whenever it was that they said they were going. And that was all well and good at the time when they talked about building this bridge from East Kapolei to that center. At the end of the day, what's happened in the meantime is you know we have a project that's not only billions of dollars over budget and years delayed, but it's proven to be a real challenge to even construct. If you look at the construction schedule to just come down to Dillingham Boulevard and what we're running into on the utility relocation and even with the shift Malka or where the stops will be or whatever, this is no small enterprise and no small feat. So we owe it to the public to do that. And that assessment right now is what our plan will be. So let me just say this. When I go to the FTA, it's going to be with them on, on where we think we can get and how far we can build it. Whether or not Alan Water is in that offering, I don't know. You know, people have talked to us about different financing plans and different ways to do it. Uh, we're looking at all of that stuff. Uh, I want to be really clear that, you know, um, I said all along during my campaign, something I've held true, and I've been involved in a lot of projects in my life that less than I learned a long time ago. If the numbers don't make sense, the strategy doesn't make sense. Right now, the numbers don't make sense to that question you've asked me, but I don't have all the information right now. I can tell you this, though. You know, having less GET and TAT is not helping the situation, which is going to be the case. Uh, so we've got a lot, you know, I look, our unemployment right now, even though our unemployment numbers have come down, we're still at 9%, mm -hmm. which is, I believe is the highest in the country. But these are very real economic factors. So it's this notion of how far can we take the rail, you know, or go building to Alwana is almost, you know, out of context with the reality that we're in. So all I want to do is knowing what the full funding grant agreement says, which is the money that the feds gave us, they promised to give us 1.55 billion to the construction of this, of which they're still holding 744 is predicated on that statement. But whether we can deliver on that statement is what's up for grabs right now. Four months into it, we're right in the process of formalizing it. And as I just told you, I told the FTA not more than 48 hours ago, we will come at you with our plan. And that's, in the, that's where we are in this moment. And as we get further down the road, I'll be happy to talk to you about being transparent and being open about the reality of rail. You know, before we let you go, I did want to ask you, you've been on the job now for a few months, and I, I wanted to just get four, your four, 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 four months, four months, four months to be exact. Okay. Uh, well, wanted, yeah. to, wanted to get your uh, comments uh, and just overall thoughts on the relationship that you've had with the state. We know that in past administration, there has been some disagreements between yeah. the mayor and the governor and those decisions. How has your working relationship been with uh, this administration and the state and, and just the overall communications that you guys have shared? That is a great question. And I'm really glad you asked me that because just as I said earlier about the role of the police chief being such a big, important leadership role in the city, so is too the mayor's job. And one of the things that I perceived coming in here was a lot of dysfunction, both with city council, with the state, it was open, almost open acrimony, if you will. And one of my determinants, and that of our entire team as an administration, is to fundamentally establish a really good working relationship with city council. And I think we're off to a great start together. I've been very respectful of Governor Ige, especially in this COVID situation, even though I think we have held a different perspective in times. He's been very gracious towards me and his acknowledgement and allowed us to make this move. But I can promise you, there was a real push to want to go back to tier two and he allowed me to keep us in tier three. 
The governor's been very open-minded like that, and I think our work with them has been good. Scott Psyche and I have actually done a couple, the speaker, we've done a couple of press conferences together and announcing we opened up with Blazer. This is unprecedented cooperation. He and I even showed up for fixing some potholes in Kaka'ako together. We've been trying to work jointly. And the third thing, which I've already alluded to, was the open rift that this office had with Hart. That was so dysfunctional. And we've worked really hard now to create that. So I think my role right now as a leader is to be highly collaborative with the city council, the state government, Hart building the city's biggest civil, civil works project in its history. And I feel really good about where we are with all those entities. I feel very comfortable in our daily conversations in all of our combined efforts to problem solve. I think that that's what I have tried to do in my role and responsibility as the mayor of the city and county of Honolulu. And out of that, we hope to achieve great things. We always love having you on. It's already the top of the hour. It goes so fast. Thank you so Too much. Fast. I want another half hour. Right? <laughs> you yeah, are always welcome. <laughs> You're always welcome to join us. Just one one more opportunity to give your parting thoughts. I know, especially to the folks, you know, to get us to that 91% that you referenced uh, in, in the survey that you saw about willingness to get the vaccine. What would you say to people who are watching today who might be a little, let's not say hesitant, because that's a different argument, but maybe a little vaccine apathetic? Yeah, well, thank you for teeing it up that way. I guess that would be a good final comment on the show is to please ask everybody. You know, we've been able to really have the lowest numbers in the country because of our, who we are as a people. The level of community cooperation when we didn't even have the vaccine, you know, at the numbers we have right now. So don't don't pull up now. Now is the time to drive it home. It's the second half here. The second half, where we know it's going to be tougher than the first half. You know, now it's probably in some cases a little bit more voluntary. Maybe people are feeling a little bit more casual. But we owe it for the greater good to get to that two million number, to get to the million people vaccinated. If we want to go on with our future, we need that to happen. And I ask everybody to please consider doing that. I keep it on a volunteer basis, not a mandate right now, and encouraging people to do the right thing. Got to love those sports references, Mayor. Thank you so much for, uh, <laughs> yeah. for being a part of our show this morning and yeah. uh, your questions. Thanks so much. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yanji, thank you. Ryan, thank always you. great to be with you guys. Take care. Aloha, thank you. Aloha. Well, very interesting to hear from the mayor there. You hear a lot of energy and a lot of passion. And I loved uh, your your question, Ryan, just about his relationships and how he really wants to turn the page uh, on all those different entities that he mentioned. Uh, and specifically when it comes to heart, he just you know told us here that he is gonna be going to the FTA sometime this summer to really drill down and say, hey, this is what we can deliver with the money that we have. And he really indicating that given the economic circumstances of the state, the restrictions on tax benefits for the city and also the high unemployment that we're seeing, all Moana might not be in the cards. Yeah, a lot to be determined. And he, you know, as he alluded in that, I think one of the things that he's focusing on right now is just that relationship, that communication with Hart, with the city council, with the state, because we know that from the past, uh, that has been a big, uh, talk, you know, a, a big headline here in, in, on our side in the media was just the disconnect between all those entities at times uh, leading to so much frustration by many in the community. So the mayor certainly making that a key point in his first four months uh, here on the job. He also talked about the tier system and where we're at. Uh, he's happy with where we're going and continue to advocate for people to get the vaccine. He believes that at some point uh, we could do away with the tier system to a degree, but also uh, but changing that by allowing and making sure that there are clear specific guidelines on what people can and can't do. Yeah, it does sound like there's a little bit of daylight between him and the governor when it comes to the CDC's recommendations about allowing people to not wear masks outdoors uh, with certain restrictions, of course, given if they're vaccinated. Uh, and the mayor saying that he respects the, the governor's decision to keep uh, Hawaii's restrictions, which are higher than the CDC's. Uh, in place, but that there there does seem to be some difference of opinion on that. But the idea that we would abolish the tier system altogether uh, is pretty new. It's not something that I've heard before. And he's really saying that, look, the vaccine really plays into his thinking that when they created that tier system, the vaccine wasn't part of the equation. Now that it is, it should change uh, what the restrictions are. Yeah. And also we talked about the role that the new HPD police chief should play uh, and, and the type of person that he would like to see in that role, saying that they have to be a, a communicator, someone in the 21st century that is able to get the message out, be able to be comfortable speaking to the public and making sure that that transparency is there. Sounds like that will be a key element in what he hopes 
the police commission will look for in selecting a new chief. Yeah, always great to hear from the mayor and uh, so much energy and enthusiasm this morning. We really do appreciate his time. On Monday, Governor David Ige will be joining us. We want to ask him about the CDC's recommendation and why he's deviating from that when it comes to mask wearing outdoors. Senator Maisie Hirona will join us on Wednesday. And then on Friday, we have Todd Bollinger, who is the executive director of Beaky. Beaky has taken a huge hit uh, this year with the pandemic. Uh, they've had to close a number of their their uh, bike stations. And so we're going to be talking to him about the future of that program and how they are making it through these tough times. Yeah, looking forward to that conversation. I'll actually be joining you from the road. I will be leaving this weekend traveling with the Hawaii men's volleyball team as they compete for a national championship. So I'll be live from Columbus, Ohio, but you'll be here in Honolulu. And we look forward to having all those conversations with you next week here on Spotlight Hawaii. Until then, we'll see you then. Stay safe. Aloha. Aloha.